Thing. Good morning, East Point Church. How are you guys? I am very, very happy to be here, but I have to admit, I'm also surprised that I'm here uh, because today is August 4th. It's my wife's due date. So if my pocket buzzes, this might be the shortest sermon you've ever heard in your life. Let's pray. Amen. You know, like, man, but, but we're excited. Hey, we're about to welcome a little girl into the world, and I'm just telling you, like, I have three boys. I just thought we'd be boy family all the way, but the Lord has seen fit. Uh, to bless me with a daughter. Just even saying that, is that not just precious? So, so, so happy. Um, and so thanks for being here. Uh, we'll get through this, I'm sure. So Isaiah chapter 6. Go ahead and open up your Bibles as you are in the book, of, as we are starting a new series in Isaiah. This week we'll be in Isaiah. Next week we'll be in Romans. Uh, we're starting a new series this week. And I just want to tell you as you turn there um, that the last two weeks have been very, very powerful in my life. Okay. Um, usually we take like a, like a seven to 10 day family vacation at the end of July. It's kind of our family time. Uh, but my wife is like 70 weeks pregnant. And so we can't go anywhere. And so we just had to accept the fact we're going to have a staycation. And so for me, like staycation is like, that's not good news. I need to be out of town. I need to have a change of scenery in order to truly unplug and rest. And so I was nervous. I was like, babe, I don't, I don't know if I could rest. Like, maybe I should just work. And she's like, you're not working. I'm pregnant. Uh, and so we had a staycation. And friends, I'm going to tell you, it has been some of the most powerful, powerful days of my life because we have been watching the Olympics. <laughs> Come on. How many of you have been consuming the Olympics for the last two weeks? I have watched more Olympics in the last two weeks than I have in my entire life. And friends, I am, I'm jacked up right now. I'm inspired I'm motivated, man. Like, just to give you some context, um, I don't like crying during movies. I cry in real life, okay? That's who I am. But, like, if my wife says, hey, I want to watch this movie with you, I always ask, will it make me cry? And if she says yes, I go, I'm out. Nope, I'm not going to do it. I don't like it. Friends, I have cried on my couch in the last two weeks. <laughs> you wouldn't even, my, my children are like concerned, like, daddy, what's wrong? They're seeing their grown man father cry because I'm just inspired. Like I see these people and they're jumping out of the pool and their face is like, I did it. I yeah, just, I'm so happy. And they're just, it's, in, look at their faces. Come on. Doesn't that make you cry? Like, for four years, these people have been training, and then, and then NBC, they're doing the coverage, so they'll like tell you their story, because they're really pulling the heartstrings, and then, and then they cross the finish line, and you just see them weeping, and I'm like, I'm weeping, and I'm crying, right? I see Taekwondo man, like, kick somebody in the face, and he's like, I win, and, and he's representing his country, and it's amazing. These are some of the most motivated people on the planet if I could sit down with them and have a cup of coffee, if I could take them out to dinner, I would just ask them, what drives you? What drives you? What is your motivation? What keeps you going when things are hard? Why do you continue to train for day in and day out for four years? I want to sit down with one of those para-kayakers. You guys see the para-kayaking? Guys, you need to watch the para kayaking. They're in this kayak and they're going by these gates. And then there's one gate that's horizontal. They literally have to spin their kayak underwater. Are you guys hearing this? This is amazing. And I want to sit down with them and I just want to ask what's your motivation? What drives you to get out of bed every day when things are hard? When you're disqualified in the, in the last Olympics and you go, man, I have four years to try again. What drives you? What inspires you? And so you hear their stories, right? You get to meet them, and there's interviews. And, and as you spend time with them, you know, through the television, you realize that they're all motivated for different reasons. And so you'll see one athlete, and he is just, he is so motivated to make his country proud. You know, like the USA, we have like 255 delegates, you know what I mean, or whatever. But like there's some countries that have like two athletes. And he's like, I am going to put my country on the map. Azerbaijan, here we go, you know? And it's just, that's their motivation, to make their country proud. There are other athletes that you hear their story, and it's just this childlike love of the game. Why are you doing this? Because I can, and it's fun. You see other athletes who are, they're motivated, and they kind of have this, like, this chip on their shoulder, and they're like, I want to prove the naysayers wrong. I'm motivated. I, I eat for fuel, for breakfast. The, the ops, they call them, right? My opponents, people who are out here saying I can't do it. I'm going to silence the naysayers. 
Other people are motivated by ambition, a desire for recognition. They're competitive. They just want to be the best, whatever it is. I just want to know what motivates them, what drives them. And so that's my question for you this morning, church, is what motivates you? If your life was to be televised on television, if you were to be put up in, in front of the whole world like the Olympics are, and they put a microphone in your face, what would you say? What's your motivation? What drives you? What, what keeps you going? What gets you out of bed? Why do you do the things that you do? Is it a desire for achievement? Do you really love the idea of being well-liked and having a lot of influence? Do you desire to make a difference? Or do you desire to make a dollar? And you're really driven by that. Do you want to see other people thrive? And you just have this philanthropic drive to have other people thrive around you. Or maybe your motivation is like my parents. My parents, neither of them finished eighth grade. And their driving force, and we would hear this often as kids, I want you to be better than I was. What's your motivation? What drives you to do the things that you do? And let's, let's expand it. Let's not just talk marketplace. Not just what do you do at work. Like, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, what is your motivation for living in obedience to God every single day? What's your motivation for, for giving to the missions? What's your motivation for discipling your children? Why do you serve at your church? What's your drive to be the church in your neighborhood and to live on mission in your workplace? What motivates you? Why are we here this morning? What's our motivation, East Point Church? Why do we do the same song and dance every week? Why is it important for us? What motivates us to give back to school supplies to our community? What motivates us to go and reach the shore? What motivates us to plant a campus in Centerville? Why do we do what we do? What motivates us? And so this morning, we're going to turn to a book in the Bible written by a man who I think it's safe to say he was motivated this guy's name was Isaiah. And 750 years before Christ came, God called Isaiah and he sent him to go and proclaim truth. He was calling him to be a prophet. And this was a very particularly difficult mission because God told him, I'm sending you to speak to people who won't listen. <laughs> You're like, that's parenting 101, right? I am sending you to go and proclaim to a people that won't listen. And you, they will not respond with repentance. They will respond with rejection. I want you to go, Isaiah, and I want you to give it all you got and then some. And I, oh, by the way, this is going to end with them sawing you in half. And he would die because of this mission. If I could sit down and take Isaiah to a cup of coffee, I would ask him the same question. What motivates you? What compels a man on this earth to go and give his life and to row in that direction? What drives him? And this morning, I'm going to show you the answer, and it's powerful. You know what his motivation was? He saw God. He saw God. Is there anybody here this morning who has seen God? What is God like? If somebody were to ask you on social media, if somebody were to ask you at work, what is God like? What would you say? And you see, what I've, what I've learned is that so often in our life, we, we settle for these flat, one-dimensional, oversimplistic views of God. And, and so we settle for these caricatures and these hashtags. You know, well, God wants me to be happy. God is love, right? And, and, and we pull verses out of context and we create caricatures with no context. And, and our view of God is woefully simple. But when we open the pages of scripture, we learn that God is like a multifaceted jewel, infinitely complex, inexhaustible in his glory. And here's what happens, right? We, we live for God and, and we see it and we go, mm, got it. That's what God is like. And then something happens in your life or, or scripture comes to life or you see truth or you experience and, and the slightest little flick of the wrist, the, the slightest little turn and you go, oh. I feel like I'm starting all over. It's a whole new view of God, a whole new uh, uh, perspective of his beauty. And so what we want to do for the next few weeks as we have this series called 3D, we want to be a church that has a 3D view 
of God's glory. We want to be a community. We want to be a family that we reject these simplistic, one-dimensional, flat views of God, and we want to see God for who he is. And friends, do you know that for all of eternity, we'll be doing this? For all of eternity, we will be mining the depths and searching the treasures and the riches of Christ. We will spend eternity. It is inexhaustible. He is infinitely glorious. He is so beautiful. And just when we think we have it, oh, I'm in awe again. And so today, for a few moments, we're just going to do one little, one little facet. Each week, we'll just do a different angle of who God is. And who knows, maybe we'll even bring this sermon series back every couple of years just to once again gaze at the beauty of his glory. And so here's what we're going to do. The very first thing we're going to see today, or maybe I should even do it like this, because it's like the summit of his glory or, or the foundation that all of the other attributes are built on is this. We are going to see his glorious grace. Oh. His glorious grace. You climb the summit of God's glory. And the chief attribute is his glorious grace. And this is what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. Let me read for you the entire passage, and then we'll pray and we'll dive in. This is God's word for East Point Church. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Father in heaven, would you open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word? Show us your glory. Give us eyes to see just how beautiful you are, and then give us hearts to respond appropriately. We love you, God. Be glorified by what we do in this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go back to the top. Look at the first few verses. It says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, this is a vision, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. See, there are times in the Bible where, where the authors will describe for you what God is like. Let me tell you what God is like. And there are other times like this where he says, Nah, let me just show you. And so the first thing we have here is a glorious vision, a glorious vision of God. And so look at the vision. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah is dead. Rip. 53 years, he ruled and reigned in prosperity and peace. This man started becoming a king at 16 years old. So for 53 years, he led the nation. And now he's dead. An era of stability gives way to transition. Let me say it this way, guys. It's an election year. A lot of uncertainty right now. How do you think people are feeling as the king, the only king they've known for 53 years, has just died? This might be the most destabilizing and insecure event of their lives. Peace, security, stability, those are all replaced by uncertainty and fear. And I'm sure many of us in this room would be asking what they're probably asking. Now what? 
And here's what Isaiah wants us to know. That even in this political turmoil, even in this era of transition, God is in control. Where is he? The Lord is sitting on the throne. Their king has fallen off the throne. Their throne is empty. But he says in that same year, in that same era, in that same period of transition and uncertainty, I looked up and behold, God is still in control. And so even as kings come and go, the king hasn't moved. Even as rulers live and die, he's alive. And in this glorious vision, we see God's control. We may not have Uzziah in 2024, but we know what it's like to live in a volatile world, do we not? We know what it's like for power to exchange hands. We know what it's like to wring our hands and worry who's going to have the majority, who's going to be the candidate, who's going to be in charge, what direction is our country going in, what's going to happen next. But in all of these things, the one true sovereign God who sits high above it all is still in control. He is the locus of power around which everything else revolves. It's not just politics. It's not just geopolitical happenings in our world. There are other things that happen in our life that can make us feel destabilized, right? Think about your life. What is something you have experienced in your life that threatened to shake the foundations of your security? What are the things in your life that have destabilized you and have produced uncertainty and fear? Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, but maybe you say, in the year that that election happened, in the year that the stock markets plummeted, man, in the year of the divorce, in the year that we got that diagnosis, man, in the year that that judge made the verdict, in that year that, even in that year, even when things threaten our security, God is still sitting in control on his throne, high and lifted up. What a glorious vision. Not only do we see God's control, we also see God's majesty. And so he sees the Lord, and what does it say? It says, the train of his robe filled the temple. Ladies, I'm curious, if you have been married, if you have had a wedding, did your wedding dress have a train or no train? I'm just curious, is that in style or not? We don't know, maybe. I know the veil that goes like every other year, right? It's like it's a veil in, it's a veil out. I don't know. But the train, when we got married, the train was in, y'all, all all right? So look at the wedding train. The, The bride, this perfect picture of beauty, she walks in and her train symbolizes, it illustrates almost like the wake of her beauty, right? Her dress is like, you know, five feet tall and the train is like 50 feet tall, you know? And it's long and and as she walks, there's like why do we have this unnecessary garment dragging all the dirt, right? If you're practical, that's what you're thinking. You're like, why do we have a train? But you're missing the poetic beauty of it. It is the echo of her beauty. It is the wake of her glory. It is the symbol and the illustration that you are experiencing something that is deserving of adoration. So rise, right? Imagine somebody sitting at a wedding and the bride starts to walk down the aisle and they're just like casually just sitting there, you know, eating their popcorn. And you're like, This is no time for casual observance. It demands that you rise. Well, in the same way, the train of God's robe, it doesn't just go down the aisle. It fills the whole temple, meaning that his splendor and his glory and his majesty is matchless. It would be wrong to ignore it casually. It would be wrong to stay sitting. It would be wrong to do anything other than standing up and worshiping. His glory compels our attention. It calls and demands for our devotion and our reverence from everyone and everything. Look who's worshiping here. Who does he see worshiping? The seraphim. Aw, little angels. If you were to ask me when I was a kid what angels look like, I'd go over to my mom's shelf and I'd grab the little precious moments doll, you know? It's like all the little angels, they're like 18 months old, and they have wings, and all of them, they're like half naked all the time, just angel butts everywhere, right? That's what we think angels look like. Oh, not here. These supernatural, majestic beings who serve God are, are full of grandeur and power. If any of us right now saw a seraphim, poof, we're dead. Like, we take our breath away, right? So majestic. These creatures are so powerful that it says that when they speak, what happens? The foundations shake. Wow. 
We should worship these things, right? No. Because as majestic as these beings are, they can't even stand in the presence of God. They don't even deserve to be eye to eye with the creator. And so it says as they fly around, they they know that they're not on casual terms with God. And so they cover their face because they're unworthy to gaze at the glory of God. It It says they cover their feet because far be it from them to just casually stroll through his presence barefoot. No, friends, even these creatures, even these supernatural beings are not worthy. So they cover themselves. This is a glorious vision, is it not? We see God's control. We see God's majesty. We also see God's holiness. And so the angels, they're flying. And what are they saying to one another? One calls out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What does holiness mean? Right? We say that we want to be holy people. We're pursuing holiness. And so if we're referring to ourselves, holiness means we are set apart. We have been devoted to a very specific purpose, God's purpose. And so, for example, growing up, my mom, she always collected china. Do do people still collect china? How many of you have china cabinets, or uh, she called it the hutch, right? Sammy, go get the dishes out of the hutch. It's time to set up for Thanksgiving, right? That was how my mom did it. And so we had this fine china. Imagine if my mom came downstairs, and she saw me eating my Cheerios out of the special Thanksgiving bowls. Ooh, I'm in trouble because those dishes are holy. They are set apart. They are devoted to a special purpose, to use those set-apart dishes for a casual means would not go well for me. And in the same way, God says, I have set you apart. You are no longer to be used for casual, worldly, earthly things. You have a purpose. You are mine. You are holy. So when we're talking about each other, that's what holiness means. But then if we say God is holy, what is he set apart to? Like what, what special thing is God set apart to? No, friends, when we say God is holy, we mean he is completely other. He is He is the thing we are set apart to. He is separate. He is in another category by himself. He's not in another category. He he is the other category. One of one, perfectly unique. He is what no being in the universe ever will be. He's God. He's holy. Like, words fail. There's nothing else to say. I love the way John Piper says it. He says, in the end, language runs out. In the word holy, we have sailed to the world's end in the, other, in the utter silence of reverence and wonder and awe. Man, what a glorious vision. I want to ask you, friends, what is God like? How do you compare the personal view of God that you have, the image of God that you've been carrying around? How does your personal picture of God compare to this glorious vision of God's holiness and his majesty and him being in control. And I just feel like Isaiah is sharing this vision with us because he wants all of us to take at our little pocket-sized gods, all the little caricatures that we've created, all the little gods that we've made in our own image, and he wants us to throw those away and to see God for who he is. Do you see God as a big God? Do you see God as so big that he demands and compels your worship? And so Isaiah, he sees all of these things. Look at the next few verses. Look at his response to the glorious vision. Verse 5, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Did you notice? He has this vision of God, and he immediately becomes (laughs) self-conscious. He immediately becomes aware of his shortcomings, and and the holiness of heaven highlights his own lack of holiness. And he realizes, I don't belong here. I don't deserve to be on speaking terms with God. The angels can't even look at him, and here I am. I saw him. In the presence of God, 
our shortcomings and our impurities become painfully clear. He feels uncomfortable, and he, and he looks at God, and he looks at himself, and he goes, I'm a man of unclean lips. And you might think, like, oh, he has a potty mouth. <laughs> you know, like, this man must cuss like a waterman. You know, he cusses like a sailor. No, no, no. He, what he means here is, at the core of who he is, his spiritual condition, he is not worthy of being in God's presence. Isaiah is probably like the best that the community had to offer. He's probably a solid dude, probably one of the most moral dudes, and yet he realizes that compared to the purity and majesty of God, even the best that mankind has to offer falls way short. His self-assessment is accurate. His humility is appropriate, and he realizes what happens when somebody like me comes into the presence of somebody like God. He says, woe is me. I'm done. I'm a goner. I'm going to be obliterated. I am looking at the one that even angels that majestic can't look at. He thinks what we all think naturally. I don't belong here. I don't deserve to be here. I have come too close to God, and now I'm a goner. He has the same rationale. I told you guys about a man that I met a couple years ago, and he comes into the church, and he goes, man, I'm so glad your church is in a YMCA, because if I were to ever step in a real church building, I'd be struck by lightning. Ha, ha, ha. And he's only half joking, right? Because at his heart, he believes what Isaiah believes. I am undone. I am unworthy to be in God's presence. Like an ant that is moving too close to the surface of the sun, I will be obliterated. What's your view of yourself? If Isaiah has convicted me of anything, he has shown me that my view of God is way too small and my view of myself is way too big. See, I'm the kind of guy that I, I, I make a mistake and I sin and my sinfulness is on display and my anger and my impatience and my short-minded, my closed-mindedness and all these things come to the surface. And, and I'm the kind of guy that instead of looking at God, I look to my left and my right, and I go, I mean, I'm not, I'm not her, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I know, come on, it's not that bad, right? I'm the kind of guy that I hear Isaiah, you know, saying just how undeserving he is, and, and something inside of me, guys, I, I want to say to Isaiah, come on, buddy, just believe in yourself, come on, it's, you're not that bad, you're, don't, I'm the kind of guy that I can justify, and I rationalize, and I explain it away, and, and if I'm not careful, when the longer you're a Christian, you start to kind of think to yourself, you know, God's kind of lucky to have me on his team. I'm just saying, I don't work for the other guy, so I mean, I'm pretty good. And, I, and, I, and you just start to have this view of yourself that you're like, take a cue from Isaiah. Remind, be reminded this morning that the God that we're talking about here, he's not a few steps above us. He's in a completely different category. Isaiah reminds us to humbly acknowledge the great contrast between God and us. We are sinful. We are unclean compared to God. I know that's not going to sell a lot of books. <laughs> like, man, church was awesome today. My pastor said I was a sinner. <laughs> Taking notes. I, I know, I get it. But it's true. It's true. Isaiah was right. We don't deserve to be here. But I'm so excited to also tell you that Isaiah was wrong. He was wrong because in the end, God did something that he didn't see coming. God does something here that none of you in this room, I dare say, could even see coming. Look what the Lord does. This glorious vision is followed by a gracious touch. So here's God. Here's Isaiah. And we see an angel, one of the seraphim, flies as a mediator, flies between the Father and Isaiah. And what does he do? He flies over to the brazier, right? That's what angels look like. Bear with me now. And he grabs a coal, and this coal is so hot that he can't even touch it. And so he brings out those tongs, and he, and he grabs those grill tongs, you know, and he brings it over, and he, and he flies. And, and why is it so hot? What does heat do? We know what heat does, right? How do you wash your dishes? With hot water or cold water? That's right, hot water. You're supposed to at least. Okay, sometimes I don't even use soap. 
<laughs> don't tell my wife, right? Sometimes I just, I don't know, I get in a trance and I'm doing dishes and I just like to watch the burning water and like the smoke is coming off the plate. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, burn, baby, burn. Just Mr. Inferno in the sink here and it's just, and it just disinfects, right? If you work in a hospital, you use heat to disinfect. We know that hot things remove impurities. Well, it's the same in the Bible. The Bible uses heat. God uses fire as an illustration, not to purify germs, but to purify sin. And so he brings a purifier. He brings an atonement. He takes this coal. And what does God do? Rather than condemning Isaiah, rather than turning away in disgust at this man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, he graciously touches him at the place of his sinfulness. In the presence of sin, God doesn't judge Isaiah's guilt. He flexes his grace. In the presence of sin, God shows that his instinct is not to shy away and look down, but to come near and to remedy. And he says, Isaiah, you're right. You don't deserve to be here. You are a sinful person. You do deserve judgment, but I'm going to take care of that my way. And he comes with the coal, and he atones. And he says, your guilt is removed. You see, God's glorious attributes climax in this one defining trait that soars above the rest, his grace. He treats us better than we deserve. God's grace is the summit of the mountain of God's glory. It's another John Piper quote. So we want want to know what God is like. And so we're climbing this mountain and we're seeing all these attributes and we get to the top and we see at the summit, it's called Grace Summit. That'd be a great name for a church. Grace Summit Church. Somebody steal that. If you want to be a church planter, let us know. We'll plant you, all right? Grace Summit Church. But we get to the summit of grace. And what do we see at that summit? It's the cross. We see the perfect image of God's grace where the one God-man who was the only one qualified to be with the Father, is instead dying for those who are unqualified. At the summit of God's grace, we see the God-man who doesn't deserve death, dying for those who deserve it. At the summit of God's grace, we see the God of Isaiah 6, who could rightly condemn us, but instead moves near to cleanse us and lay down his life for us. Do you see him? We serve a God who doesn't move away from sin. He moves toward it. He's a God who is willing to make all who come to him clean, not by picking up a coal, but by picking up a cross. Friends, I'm asking you this morning, where are you aware of your sin? What aspects of your life do you become self-conscious of in the presence of God? Where does God's Spirit convict you and show you, you fall short? Lean into that. Where do you feel that? And come clean. Because all who come to Him are made new. Have you experienced the gracious touch of God? Do you know what it's like to walk in feeling dirty and unlovable and broken and to walk out experiencing the greatest love in the universe? Do you know what that feels like to experience his grace and forgiveness, to be made clean and pure, to have all of the labels that society has put on you as dirty and used and filthy and unreliable and untrustworthy, to have those washed away and to have one label left, child of God. Do you know what it's like to experience that gracious touch? Here's the beautiful irony that we can't miss here. Isaiah's experience shows us this, and this goes against everything that culture says. This goes against our instincts, so pay attention. It's those who humble themselves, those who acknowledge that they deserve judgment, they're the ones who escape it. Isn't that beautiful? It's the humble who know that they deserve judgment, who instead experience grace. And so you see our culture and our instinct says, no, no, don't confess that. Put on a mask. Pretend. Present yourself better than you really are. Come on, you got to believe. It's those who come clean who realize, I'm messed up. They're the ones who experience God's grace because 
God, it's, it's music to God's ear, the cry of a needy sinner. When somebody says, God, I don't deserve you. I need your help. God in heaven rises to his feet and he moves near and he says, I'll take care of that myself. So Isaiah, he has seen a glorious vision. He has experienced a gracious touch. And now in our final verse, he's going to experience a gripping call. Look at verse 8, last verse. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Here's the gripping call. Isaiah is in the throne room. He has just experienced God's grace. He has just experienced something that he should never deserve to experience, and he's still here. And as he's sitting there going, I can't believe it. I'm loved by God. I'm cleansed. I'm made new. I'm atoned for. Wow. He, his ears perk up as he realizes God is deliberating. God is God's on a mission. It sounds like God's working on the whiteboard, and, and he has this plan. He has this initiative that he's going to start, and, and he's recruiting. And he hears the holy Godhead conferring, whom shall we send? Through whom are we going to get this done? Who will go for us? And he's deliberating, and he's recruiting, and, and Isaiah, without contemplation, without discussion, he doesn't look at his finances, he doesn't look at his five-year plan, he doesn't ask his friends, he shoots to his feet and he says, here am I, send me. He's compelled to go. Why? Not because of his experience, not because he's filled with self-confidence, not because of his prior you know, resume. He's doing this because he has just experienced the glorious grace of God. And friends, here's the big idea. Experiencing God's grace moves us to spread God's glory. When you experience God's grace, when you see him for who he is, that motivates you, that moves you to spread his glory. There is no other option. It's overwhelming. It's compelling. Everything else in my life pales in comparison to what I have just beheld. God's glory. And so now every part of my life becomes a means to my single greatest motivation, to spread the glory of God. Here am I, send me. Here are my finances, send me. Here is my time, God, send me. Here's my family, send me. Here are my decisions, here are my plans, here's my work ethic, here are my relationships, here are my hopes and dreams. They are all yours, send me. Because I have experienced your glorious grace and I want every part of my life to now spread your glory. Friends, what motivates you? Are you motivated to spread the glory of God's grace? Isaiah was motivated. Friends, this is, this is our motivation. If, you're, if you call East Point Church your home church, like, look at our mission statement here. This is how we begin our mission statement, to glorify God as a gospel community that is growing in faith and reaching the world. Do we want to reach the world? Yeah! Do we want people in community? Yes! Do we want to see people go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and follow Jesus? Yes! But why? Well, we want to see people's lives changed. Yes, that's secondary. That's kind of weird to think about, right? I thought our whole point was to change people's lives. That's secondary. All of those desires and initiatives flow from an even greater motivation to glorify God. God will be most glorified. The spotlight will shine most brightly on his beauty when people come to know him, when they grow in faith, as they gather in community, as they live on mission to the world. What is the single greatest motivation of your life, friends? I'm telling you, experiencing God's grace moves us to spread God's glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are just so grateful for this vision. God, how would, how would we know what you're like if you didn't reveal yourself? And so thank you for showing us your beauty. Thank you for revealing your grace. Thank you, Lord, for that grace. Because if we're being real, if we're being honest, we don't deserve you. And so it blows our mind that you choose to posture yourself toward humanity with grace. 
And so, Lord, I ask for myself, for my family, and for my church family. God, may every part of my life be used to spread your glory. God, it is yours. No part of my life is off limits. There's not a square inch of this universe that you do not say, mine, over. And so, Lord, all of my life is yours. I love you. Here I am. Send me. God, we as a church, we are committed to sharing and spreading the fame of your glorious grace. So would you send us? God, I pray that every friend that walks into these doors for the first time would leave just so blown away by the grace that you show us. And then lastly, Father, I just pray right now for those in this room that they're new to this and they're not walking with you. They don't know you. They have not experienced that gracious touch yet. But Father, even right now, faith is welling up in their hearts and they say, I dare to believe that God can overlook and atone for all of my mistakes and my brokenness. And so Lord, as they cry out to you in faith, would you save them? Give them a new heart, give them a new spirit, baptize them into new community, give them a new purpose, give them a new life and a new eternity. Save them, holy God, because of what Jesus has done for them. Lord, I love you. We praise you. May you receive all the glory of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.